All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to UTSA's downtown campus here at the College of Public Policy. Uh, my name is Chris Stewart. I'm a student here in the College of Public Policy. Um, and welcome to our event, To Pay or Not to Pay, talking about the issue of city council pay in San Antonio. Uh, first, we'd like to start off by thanking the College of Public Policy and thanking everybody that you know, made this possible and thanking our fantastic professor, Dr. Francine Romero, for all of her hard work. And, <laughs> um, and also here we'd like to recognize from Congressman Lloyd Doggett's office, Andrew Solano. So we're here today to discuss the issue of council pay in San Antonio. Um, and it's important to remember that this, we're doing this as a part of a class, so uh, you know, not as the College of Public Policy. We're not advocating uh, any policy change or advocating any specific avenue. Um, we just want to have a fruitful dialogue, hopefully have some engagement going on, and um, maybe come out of this with a way forward and sort of uh, figuring out where the public is on this issue. Um, so without further ado, to do a little bit of pre-event live polling, I'm going to introduce a member of our logistics team, Drew Gatlin. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, today we're doing a very interesting uh, thing. We did it uh, for our first event, uh, but we're doing a live polling event. Um, so basically the way it works is if you'll break out your cell phones, uh, you're going to do this via text message. If you have any questions, feel free to just raise your hand. We've got some guys that can come around and help out. So our first question of the day is how much do we pay our city council members? The way this works is in the two line to your cell phone, like where you would text a person's name, you're gonna text the number 376607. That's 376607. And then once you pick, pick your answer in the message body of it, that's where, you, where you'll put the rest of the code. So you'll put, if you don't know, you'll put 44355. We'll give it a second, and it should auto-populate. There we go. And what this does is this tracks uh, the answers, but it also gives us the uh, number of people that respond. Um, so we'll give it probably another 20 seconds or so to populate, and then we'll move on for the rest of the presentation. But thank you so much for this information. We really appreciate it. This will continue to auto-populate, and then we can uh, use this information for future uh, research and everything. So thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to introduce Lorna Griffin. She's going to come up and give us uh, some information and some data on this topic. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Lorna Griffin, and I would also like to welcome you all here today. Thanks for taking time out of your day to be here. Um, for this important discussion. So the focus of our topic today is around the issue of city council pay. Um, as many of, of you uh, are aware, San Antonio pays its city council members $20 per meeting. This was adopted in 1952 as part of our city charter. Um, and our city council basically meets weekly. So what if we wanted to make a change to our city's charter? Well, there are a couple of ways that we could do this. Uh, one way is for a city council to bring it to a vote to present to, to voters on a ballot. And the other way is by way of um, citizen um, petition. Um, an amendment can be proposed every two years. Our most recent charter change was in May 2012. So this chart here lists um, council members' salaries in major cities throughout the country. It's a little tough to read the numbers uh, just because of our, the contrast on our chart. But um, on the far left side, we have Los Angeles at the top end of the spectrum with 178,000 compensation per year. Um, Houston, we, here in Texas, 55,000. Dallas is at 37,000. And way on the right end of the spectrum is San Antonio. And we pay our council members 1040 per year. So when we consider council pay, we have to think about what we ask of our city council members. What do we ask them to do? Um, this is a chart. I know, again, the numbers are kind of small. 
but it represents um, the number of citizens per council members in major cities throughout the country. So um, Los Angeles, they compensate their council members a lot, but they also represent a lot of citizens. Here in the middle, highlighted in yellow, is San Antonio. And basically each council member represents 124,879 citizens. So let's take a look at council salaries uh, just outside of San Antonio. San Marcos pays its uh, members 11,400. New Braunfels compensates theirs at 1,200 per year. And again, San Antonio is at 1,040 per year. And um, here we see how other elected official salaries compare. And when, when people talk about uh, making a change to city council pay, um, they, they talk about um, median in income for the city. So highlighted in yellow is San Antonio's uh, median income at 43961 So in 2004, San Antonio voters considered making a change in city council pay uh, by way of charter amendment. Um, the uh, Proposition 2 proposed a change, uh, which was the median income at the time, of 30000 per year for council members and about $41,000 salary for the mayor. And it was rejected by 66% of the vote. But if we take a look at voter turnout, we had 7.2% of registered voters vote in that election. So very clearly, the voters were opposed to that in 2004. Uh, Roddy Stinson, who was a columnist, a columnist for the Express News, uh, who was opposed to the measure at the time, wrote an article, no, no, no. Um, so this is following that um, election in 2004. And actually the Express News did in endorse the charter revision um, before the vote. So fast forward to 2013. There's been some attention this year, especially uh, about the issue of, of revisiting city council pay. There's been some stronger support. Um, here are some recent headlines from the San Antonio Express News and um, other local media. So as Chris and Drew mentioned, uh, a major focus of our class this semester is the issue of civic engagement. And two weeks ago, our class here on campus hosted a research event, and we had a group of about 30 participants, and our group was uh, pretty diverse. We held a roundtable discussion of about four or five people at a table. Of those surveyed, we see that we had uh, pretty much all age groups represented um, during our focus group. This is an ethnic breakdown of the people that participated. It's pretty representative of San Antonio. And some of the general findings from our session were um, people, some of the members that were here were, are very civically engaged and then other people who participated never even heard about city council pay. So towards the end of the session, there was a, a general support for a move toward increasing um, city council salary. So, um, a couple of numbers were suggested. Probably the most common uh, salary amount suggested was the median income for San Antonio. Some, su some uh, suggested a higher amount. Um, they agreed that the current system sort of precludes typical working people from serving on our city council. And uh, participants generally wanted more details. They wanted to know, how would this happen? 
you know, how would we decide on a proposed salary? What's appropriate? Uh, they also wanted to know where the money would come from, especially with um, some our city's budgetary constraints. They wanted to know, you know, exactly how that would happen. Would there be a cost of living adjustment, you know, rolled into the proposal? Um, everyone generally agreed that there should be a broader public dialogue on this, uh, but, but they weren't sure how that would happen. Um, a lot of the participants thought education and awareness were key to um, uh, letting people know more about city council pay issues. So also at our last event, we had um, instant polling um, of the participants of our focus group. 48% of them got their main news source from the internet. 66% um, felt that a, a salary would make council members better representatives. And 68% of the group had, um, they had heard about the city council pay issue uh, prior to the event. And the last question we asked um, during our research session was whether their perspective had changed. And 50% had said that they did have some change. So one of the specific questions from our research event, and getting back to city council salaries, was why does Los Angeles pay their city council members so much? Again, that number is 178,000 per year. And we wondered why that was. So prior to 1990, they were compensated 61,000 522 per year and they passed measure H which basically gave them a $25,000 raise to match compensation of the municipal judges and because there was virtually no media attention to that measure it passed um, also some members of our focus group had questions about inflation uh, the twenty dollar amount that was approved in 1951 would equal <laughs> would equal nine thousand three hundred and forty one dollars today. And also from our event, we had some sa sample quotes. These are things that we actually heard from our participants. People said we need more dialogue. People don't pay attention to local government because they feel that they aren't directly affected. Uh, people wondered, would council members' public interest change? Are they going to do the right thing if they are paid? And they wondered, why pay them more? The, they only represent special interest groups, not me as an individual. And another participant said, well, whether we pay them or not, they should be held more accountable. So I'm going to ask Drew to come back up and do a mid-event poll. Thank you so much, Lorna. Um, thank you for that. If everybody will take out their cell phones again, we're going to do two more quick questions. Um, same style as previously, and the same exact number is what you're going to text to, but the numbers for the message will change. The first question is, do you think that we should pay our city council members more than we do now? We'll give it about another 15 seconds and then uh, we'll move to the next question. Okay, and our second question of this session is, if we were going to pay our city council members a salary, how much should they be compensated annually? The first question is same as, uh, the first answer is the same as we do now, $20 a meeting. The second answer, the 93.4180, is adjusted for inflation only, and then 25,000, 35,000, 45,000 or more.
<clears throat> we'll give it another 10 seconds. Looks like we've got some consensus between 35 and 45,000 for right now. Okay, we're going to move on to the panel discussion. If I could ask the uh, panelists to come forward and go ahead and take your seats. I'm going to pass this over to Mr. Chris Stewart, and he is going to lead us uh, as our moderator. Oh. And uh, this is the last of the clapping until the end, I promise. But I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists here. Um, we thank them all for being here. Great panel for today's discussion. First, we have former Councilwoman Elena Guajardo. She was raised in a family grocery store business in Westside San Antonio. She earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Texas at Austin and her master's in social work at the Wharton School of Social Service at Our Lady of the Lake University. In 2005, she won an open council seat in District 7, a position she served in until 2007. Next up, we have Mr. Christian Archer. He has years of experience in Texas politics, having worked for such figures as former Austin Mayor Will Wynn, former Houston Mayor Bill White, and San Antonio Mayor Phil Hardberger and Julian Castro. Under the Hardberger administration, he was special assistant to the mayor, in which he uh, oversaw the passage of the largest bond package in history at the time. He's currently a partner at the Adelante Strategy Group. Uh, next is Mr. Gilbert Garcia. Gilbert Garcia is a Metro columnist for the San Antonio Express News with nearly 20 years experience writing for weekly and daily newspapers. Now, as a graduate of Harvard University, he has won awards for reporting on music, sports, religion, and politics. He's the author of the 2012 book, Reagan's Comeback, Four Weeks in Texas that Changed American Politics Forever. And one of his feature stories appeared in the national anthology, Best Music Writing 2001. And our final panelist, uh, Weston Martinez. A fifth generation San Antonian, Weston Martinez has a bachelor's degree from Wayland Baptist University and over 18 years business experience with AT&T and the oil and gas industry. He has been active in the nonprofit sector, including involvement with the United Way and the San Antonio Children's Shelter. In 2011, he was appointed to the Texas Real Estate Commission by Governor Perry, a role in which he has served three of his six year term. Thank our panelists for being here. We're going to try and get in as many questions as we can. Um, so we're going to start out with our first question. Uh, general question, and this is going to be a tough one. <laughs> in 10 words or less, because as we know, brevity is the soul Ooh, of wit. That is tough. What do you think of the current situation? And we'll start with you, Ms. Guajardo. OK, uh, first, thank you. Don't put that as my 10 words, please. Uh, I want to thank you, and I want to put an announcement. Gilbert's birthday is tomorrow, so we got to give him that. <laughs> Put that in. This will be very brief, and it's going to be concise. The, merit, the, the proposal has merit. It really does. However, the, it will always be, the devil will be in the details and in the implementation. It is time, but you're going to need a leader, and you're going to have to have the right timing, and you're going to have to figure out the complexity of when to put that in, because with longer terms, it is more complex than it would have been had we had the same structured four-year terms. So brevity, that's it. <laughs> uh, I think that was just about 10. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting better. <laughs> same question. Uh, you know, we're the seventh largest city in America. We expect our council members to oversee a $1.4 billion a year budget, and we don't pay them anything. Uh, how do you expect excellence uh, when our council members have to swear an oath of poverty in order to serve their communities. It's absurd and we need to, you know, we need to move with the times and we need to pay them an appropriate salary. I, I think that the debate is what is appropriate, um, but to expect someone to, you know, work full time around the clock, administer a $1.4 billion a year budget and not be paid anything, nobody in this audience would be willing to do that. Uh, you know, and go to work every day. Well, if you were willing, if you're willing to go to work every day uh, and work around the clock, seven days a week, 24 hours a day for twenty dollars a week, I would like to hire you <laughs> because that's that's the. That's I chose to serve my community. That shouldn't be a surprise. So again, clocking in just at ten. Yeah, yeah, oh, ten that words. That's perfect. <laughs> Sorry. I've, over the years, I've talked to some people who've, a few people who've served on the, uh, both city council and uh, the Bear County Commissioner's Court. 
uh, they always say, I worked a lot harder when I was a council member than I did when I, uh, I worked uh, uh, for the county. And I got $20 a week uh, working city council, and then I made more than $100,000 a year uh, as, a, as a commissioner. Uh, something's wrong with that picture. All right, and finally, Mr. Martinez. Thank you for having me. Happy birthday, Gilbert. Thank you. That doesn't count towards my 10 either, Elena. <laughs> okay. um, we need servant leaders. We need people that are going to be statesmen, and I think we have to try everything we can to try to produce that type of environment that requires people to have a passion and a heart to serve. If you're going to approve paying city council members, then you're going to have to change the form of government from a city manager form of government to a strong mayor form of government. And by the city council's vote today to increase Cheryl Scully's salary to $375,000 and then up it to 400000 in 2015, to me it sends a mixed message. All right, so now uh, the next question is going to be for Mr. Garcia. Uh, now, nine years ago, as Lorna had talked about, we did have a proposed salary increase that was shot down at the ballot box. Uh, why do you feel that that is, and why do you feel no one has taken it up since then? Well, I, I think um, at that point, there was, uh, you know, we'd had some, some scandals in the early part of that decade uh, in, involving a city council. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I can't speak about the, the you know the, the broad history of uh, San Antonio politics but I, I think if we're looking recently that was uh, that was a period when uh, uh, the voter confidence and support for city council was was at a real low and uh, so I, I and I, I think also the, the the forces against it were very effective at, at, at mobilizing you know the thing is it's it's always hard to get people to feel sympathetic about elected officials it's it's just, i think there's something in our collective dna that you know if, if you if you met anybody else who, who told you you know i'm working 40 50 hours a week and i'm getting paid 20 dollars a week you think what's going on here you know this this sound it, it sounds like you know uh, like some kind of sweatshop uh, situation or something it, it really sounds kind of absurd um but we don't we don't have that so we, we think well well these people they they, they choose they chose to do it Nobody forced them to do it. They they decided to run for office. So that's the, their reward is 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 the the position. And even if they're having to, to scrape by and and uh, you know and, and and borrow money or or do whatever they have to do, um, you know that that's that's the deal. And you know I I would say uh, people enlist in the military when they when they do that they're choosing to do it. No one's forcing them to do it. Should we not pay people who serve in the military? Should we should we if we if we yeah, I mean that would be it'd be absurd, but for some reason we don't recognize the service when it's an elected official. We don't see that as service. We think, you know, there, this is this is something that they uh, that the reward is the office itself, and I, I don't accept that. Uh, so, Mr. Archer, same question, but uh, you know, more specifically, um, why do you think no one has taken this up since then? Is it still toxic? Or? Well, you know, I, when I ran Phil Harberger's campaign. You know, we had a we had a we had a funny line. There were three council members in jail at the time, and I said, if we just put two more there, we'll have a quorum, and we can go ahead and we can pass legislation in the local jail. Uh, so I think that that really is 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 the heart of the matter. Same thing happened in Austin, by the way. And Austin went to these incredibly restrictive terms and amount of money that that you were able to. And when I ran Will Wynn's campaign for mayor of Austin, the most you could give to a to a campaign was one hundred dollars. Uh, you know, it's absurd to run a, 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 a big citywide campaign when the most you can contribute is $100. And since then, they've come back to being more reasoned, and they've actually taken San Antonio's approach to 10, 10 council member districts. But so I think that I think that that hurt a lot, um, having the corruption um, played, a, played a major role in that. But let me say this, the, 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 during that time period, they also restricted the term limits mm -hmm. to two two year terms. So the most you can serve is four years as a council member, and that's what Mayor Hardberger served four years. And then um, I ran the, the campaign to extend the term limits uh, from two two-year terms to four two-year terms. Uh, and, you know, the, the confidence was growing in San Antonio, in the elected officials, in the council, and Hardberger's approval rating was consistently in the mid-'80s, which helped boost her confidence um, to allow us to even approach term limits at the time. I wanted to include council pay at the time, and it would have been, it would have ended the campaign. It would have been the death knell. 
But three weeks out from the election, it was still 60-40 against extending the term limits. You know, that's absurd. I mean, you know, when you get there, it, it, it takes a long time to get the process and to get to know, you know, what, what, what you're even doing uh, every day as a council member. So it takes a period of time, much less to think, you know, visionary toward the future of what we want to get accomplished. Um, and so we, we kind of spun the, the campaign message on its head. Um, and we're polling 60-40 against, we're going to lose, we know we're going to lose. And so we turned the message around and said, well, you'll get an opportunity to vote them out every two years. Uh, and everybody responded and says, as long as I get to vote them out of office, uh, they were willing to extend and allow four two-year terms. And uh, we flipped it on its head in the last two weeks and got it to pass. And we actually ended up getting some margin, and it passed with, with about, I think it was four or five points. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was, a, it was a dramatic turnaround. So I think confidence in City Hall, sorry to go on and on, I think confidence in City Hall is really high, and I think now it would pass if we put it before the voters, and it was a reasonable, smart, smart plan. Uh, so, Ms. Guajardo. Yes. As sorry. a former city council person, uh, in your experience, do you think that constituents place a value on what their city council people do? I mean, do you think there would be a willingness to make this change? Can I go back to this question, and then it, it ties into Absolutely. this question. Um, to, I wrote some history this morning. I was getting my, my, you know, because I was coming, and it was like when it was it was Mayor Ed Garza that took the first initiative, and then it was it was t length of term and then pay. He fumbled that football so many ways, it it didn't happen. So here we are, the city of San Antonio. And we got Mayor Phil Harberger, someone who wasn't a politician. He was an elder statesman. And what I loved about serving with Phil Harberger is was he didn't have anything to gain. It was about public servant, just like you say, sir. And so he looked at the dynamics of our city in a totality. What is best for the city? It's not for my next political gain two or three cycles from now. It's what is best now. The urgency was for him was what is best now at this moment. And so when he, there was polling done and I asked the mayor, why two terms? I mean, two year terms, sir. I said, how about three? Because at least you're in the, you know, you get in the saddle and then you have to start another campaign. And he gets this little paper out of his pocket and he goes, Elena, Three won't win, two wins. <laughs> I said, okay, sir, but you know who really wins? The political consultants <laughs> and Big all victory. the sign people and everything. <laughs> we're into another campaign. So why it worked was what was happening there, the confidence level, but you had a senior statesman who took the leadership, and they did it in a time frame at the beginning of his second term when he had nothing else to lose. It's like, I'm taking the bull point. I'm going to say this is what we need to do now to create better government. Now, one of the, the slides that you had here was conversation points about how f people saw city government. So that might have been people in this audience or other class people that those were the quotes for, from. One of the last points on those, one of the quotes was, there seemed, well, the whole total package is there's a disconnect between who sits at a dais and you, and your neighborhoods, your communities. I would say on council, and, and when Dr. Fris uh, Romero has asked me to come speak, I'll say, I love city government. I fell in love with city government. You give me an agenda, you give me enough dots on every vote, I'll get it back to your neighborhood. I'll get it back to your pocketbook. Anything, everything that happens on Thursday when they are voting, it affects our city, it affects you. It's gonna affect you faster than any other place, any other cycle of government. Right. And what I loved about it, it was nonpartisan. It is the only still place in our governmental system where I could sit next to, uh, the only declared Republican was um, uh, Kevin Wolf. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he came to me one day, he says, colleague, you're sounding pretty Republican today. <laughs> and I said, colleague, I can be just a, uh, a fiscal conservative as you, but in my neighborhood, they call it being pinche. <laughs> so, and, it, and it was like, we could debate an issue on the merits of the issue. 
And sadly, what those comments showed to me today, there's still this disconnect. And I'm sorry that it's happening, ladies and gentlemen, because it is affecting you, your families, your neighborhood, everything. You need to be involved. When you, there was a line, they're not held accountable. Well, it's not just the voting that holds them accountable. You do. Every Thursday, are you saying, are you being involved? Some people think it's, 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 it's uh, dull to see city council. There's a rhythm about it. it they they show, I mean, get involved. Look at it. Go sit there one day and show your face because that's, that's true participation. I want to let me just add one, one quick thing too about term limits and I think that yeah. if you were to get council pay uh, on the ballot uh, one of the one of the big mm -hmm. talk points was it didn't apply to anybody on the council mm -hmm. and so when Hardberger said I want this to pass and I won't accept the benefits of it in other words you know I won't serve four more years I'm done after this and it had to apply to you. It applied to everybody on the dais. Mm -hmm. Was it wasn't it wasn't a, a personal thing, a personal gain, yeah. and and that went a long way with people understanding and nodding their heads, saying, "Oh, he's doing what's best for the city and not for his political career." And that is like an important you. question that we're going to get into yeah. a little bit later. Um, but I have to get down to Mr. Martinez. I promise, I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> hey, hey. Um, so our question for you, um, you know, we saw on the slides that San Antonio is different than other cities. Um, in terms of how it pays its council people. Um, but the flip side of that would be it makes us unique. Um, so is there something special or unique about the way that we have our system now? What do you think we lose if we start paying council people? Well, first off, people that uh, people generally make the common mistake statement that San Antonio will be a world-class city. You know, there's this futuristic you know, uh, chase to the end of the rainbow to find where we're going to finally become a world-class city. Alamo Dome, you know, mm -hmm. it's going down the list, pre-K for SA, um, trolley. Hate to educate <laughs> our kids. <laughs> you know, and, and I, really, I really believe that, one, we have to recognize that we are a world-class city, and we have, you know, it's the biggest small town in America, is what I tell people to come here. And if you sit and think about it, it really is. It's the biggest small town. You can go to downtown and see your neighbor. You can go north to the airport and bump into somebody else. But... We have, to, we have to somehow balance it so that we don't create some sort of an aristocracy. And I think that in today's environment, because people are so connected to their, you know, to their, their Facebook and their FaceTime and their, their faces right here, well, where's the elected official? Where's the representative government? And as Elena said, the people need to get back engaged. How are they gonna get engaged if you allow the elected officials to become more disconnected? Because now, right, they're, they're more equipped and more able in certain ways. And I'm, I'm very concerned that you create a bigger vacuum than is already there. Okay. Um, so now we're going to have a general question. Um, and on this one, I just need a number. <laughs> if you could wave your magic wand today and, you know, put city council pay uh, in, what would be the, uh, you know, your sort of ideal amount? Um, and we'll start with, uh, we'll start down with Mr. Martinez. I'd keep it the way that it is, zero. I would say uh, 50,000 for each council member and 60,000 for the mayor. I'm, I'm kind of in line with Gilbert. I think that, I'm oh, sorry, the number, $50,000. I was asked this same question in 2005 in my first race. So here we are 2013 and we're still asking the question. And my answer then, I can't give you a number because I don't know the specific number, but my answer then, and we are a conservative city when it comes to money. So knowing that, my answer was whatever the poverty level rate is for a family of four in San Antonio, if you have to sell it, you can't go high. You have to put it to some brevity. So it was then. That's even less than a living wage would be. So that was my answer then, and it has to be, to me, it has to be something that people could accept and then later increase. But we are so into numbers in this city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you want to say something? I do want to say <laughs> I know, something. I mean, you listen. I mean, come on. I, I, you know, uh, put, it, put it to a, a principal of a high school or, or a district judge or some some other relative person I mean poverty 
Really? Well, okay, Poverty. The, the median I mean, I look, I, was forty three nine. Well, I, okay, I, I said fifty thousand okay. dollars. I mean, you can equate it to an, uh, something that you expect from other people at that same level, but it's a like I said, one point four billion dollars. <laughs> We don't want to say, oh, well, let's just go right at poverty for these folks. I mean, we expect excellence, and we shouldn't accept anything less than excellence. And, you know, I'm not saying pay them. I think Cheryl Scully, you know, the, the comment that Wesson was making, we're going to pay her $400,000 a year. Well, let me say something. I was, I was there when Cheryl Scully was, was brought to San Antonio. I was part of that, that team that did that. And by having a AAA bond rating, by, not, by going after the best in the nation – and saying, you're going to run the city. We have a AAA bond rating. When we went after, and I've run the campaigns for $1.2 billion in bonds. By having a AAA bond rating, we have saved tens of millions of dollars by having a AAA bond rating, and that's because of Cheryl's leadership. $400,000 a year? Of course. It's the easiest money that we could spend by having excellence. And that's what we ought to demand from our elected officials as well. But businesses are moving to shirts and north of San Antonio uh, ETJ because they don't want to be into the city of San Antonio with the tax rate that we have and some of the other things. So, you know, to tax rates have gone down every every year since I've been involved in San Antonio politics. All right, well, let's let's refocus. This is what will happen so in the inner circle. <laughs> with this, with this <laughs> <laughs> let's refocus this because I think I think that is that's sort of a good point to bring up. So, Mr. Martinez, I mean, do you think there is any good about keeping the job purely about public service without any real pay? Or, I mean, what do you think is the value? What do you think is the value in that? How many of you go volunteer somewhere, anywhere? Next question. How many of y'all get paid for that? Is that not a value to our community? Is, are we not, when we talk about getting our citizens engaged, if we're going to let them be engaged, why don't we allow them to be engaged and let's see where their heart is? You know, if everybody asks, the, you know, everybody makes a political statement. You want to see where a politician's heart is? Look where they donate their money. I won't get into who's donated what recently, but just look at it. It's a big issue. So the question is, how engaged do we want the city? And that is really that's really the heart of it. So you've got to uh, you've got to keep servant leaders in this position. Uh, if you're going to pay, I mean, do you really think they're going to want to get paid less than county commissioners? I don't, I don't think so. You're going to have to. <laughs> I don't think they're going to. So now you're talking about a million dollars a year in salary to those people, and we've got a shortfall in the budget. You know, again, unless you're going to change the form of government to a strong mayor form of government, you know, let's, let's keep it the way it is so we can, like you said, we had some bad apples a while back. Mm -hmm. How do we go a little bit longer to show that people's true heart is in the service to keeping San Antonio a world-class city. Okay, and then we're going to have one more question, then a general question, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, so this one's going to be for you, uh, Mr. Garcia. Now, you said that according to uh, a City Hall insider recently, nobody wants to be the poster child for paying <laughs> council members. Now, why do you think that that <laughs> is the case? Well, you know, kind of getting back to the, the point I made earlier, which is that no one, as a, a, we don't gen tend to feel sympathetic toward, toward uh, our elected officials. And so elected officials recognize that nobody, uh, I don't think there's, uh, uh, I mean, there are council members who are, who are struggling right now financially. Uh, I'm sure they would welcome uh, a, a pay increase, but you know, who wants to who wants to take the lead on, on something like that when it uh, and we talked about how Mayor Hardberg when he when the term limits were extended he was able to to frame it as something that was not that he was not going to benefit from and and the current council members were not going to benefit from and and that's an, an issue we'd have to get into I think here as far as how you know Christian talked about this would have to be done in a smart way and I think that's that's that it's it's going to be really tricky because now we have people can serve as long as eight years when do we when do we say that this would kick in if it if it passes. Uh, but yeah, I think I think people recognize that it's it's a political it's a political loser if you're recognized as the person who's out there doing this. It it, it really and that's why I think it's important that, that we're doing this because I think it, there really needs to be something of a ground a, a public groundswell uh, that, that that builds on this issue because um, if it if it feels like like people like uh, elected officials are doing it and they're they're leading the charge in, in out of self interest. It's going to have problems. And that leads very well into our final question. And we want to keep these answers brief so that we can make sure we get to as many uh, questions from our audience as possible. Um, but our class, we're all about uh, you know, civic engagement, citizen engagement. So 
what is the citizen's role? What can the citizen do in bringing this issue forward or being engaged in this issue? Um, what do you see as that role? We'll start with you, Ms. Guajardo. I think the first thing that hits me, what has not been spoken about, and, and it's even true for new council people. I've, I've, uh, some have, after they win, they might see me somewhere and they'll go, I had no idea it was going to take this much time. Because you don't know it till you're in those shoes. And, and David did a wonderful expose about former Councilman David Medina because mm -hmm. those numbers are on, were on the Thursday agenda. Was he in the chair or not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's a lot of other meetings that a council person has. And those are never clocked. Neighborhood meetings, et cetera. So the pay is, you know, what you're paying for Council people that come in don't understand, because they've never been in the shoes, how much time it does take. But you as constituents, do you know, when it comes to voting, do you know what you're asking that council person to do? When we vote council people in, it is the lowest voter turnout of all the votes. Less than 10%, and that vote was at 7.2%. It is getting lower and lower when we're voting for council person and school board people, and that's the most immediate effect, school board and council. The lowest voter turnout. So when you're talking about engagement, it's what, with council pay, you'll get more people. Doesn't mean you're gonna get better people. So let me put that out there. It is up to you to question the quality of the servant heart that that person has. Okay, Mr. Archer. You know, I, I, there, Elena hit it right on the head. People need to vote. People need to get out and express their opinion by 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 going and voting. And and I think, um, I think council pay would actually bring in more people that would consider running for office um, if they could actually uh, feed their families. Um, you know, we don't ask firefighters. We believe in service, but we don't ask firefighters to do it for free. Gilbert's point about the military. I mean, you can be a servant and you can get a check for it and it doesn't make you an evil or bad person <laughs> because you get to eat at night or pay your mortgage. I mean, it's absurd. Uh, it's a totally faux argument that because you volunteer, um, you should, you know, all of a sudden vow poverty for your life. Wrong. But citizens engagement, voting, participation, I think that as you have more competitive races, uh, when you look at District 8, um, last cycle between uh, 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 Nuremberg and Briones, because there was, so, there, was, there was a great political battle going on, District 8 represented one-third of all votes cast in 10 districts mm -hmm. because there was, a, there, was a, there was a battle, and people were, they were debating ideas, and pre-K for SA was in the mix and all the different things, and people started paying more attention. It was one-third of the entire city turnout, one council district, because there were engaged uh, people in, in, in the voting process. So I think it brings better, higher quality candidates to the table because they can feed their families at night. Okay. Mr. Garcia, same question. Okay. Uh, well, and what was the, the what question was, would be uh, oh, what just getting can public involved. Do, you know, what, what can we, how can we be involved? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, it, it's, it, it's a tough, I think that, that um, there, there is a process by which uh, you know, people, a petition drive could start with the public, and I and I, I don't know if that would it would make a difference as far as how well the uh, the, uh, the the charter amendment uh, uh, issue would would fare if 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 it came it would be tougher to get it through that process than trying to get the council to to get it uh, on the ballot. But I think that it might be might be perceived differently. But I think that um, you know, just a very basic thing that people can do, I think, is to to uh, express to their individual council members. That this is something that they uh, that they support. You know, I think that elected officials are inevitably. It, it's natural they're going to be concerned. They're going to they're going to feel that that uh, <coughs> voters are going to be unhappy uh, about something like this. And if, and if if people in individual districts can express to their council members that they do support this, that they understand what the issue is, that they don't see it as a as a question of uh, people, you know, being. Uh, running for office and being greedy and trying to, to, to get rich while they're in politics, but that, that this is just about, as Christian said, just feeding your family. I, I think that's important. And finally, Mr. Martinez. 
there's so much that's happened, even in just the last, you know, eight months. Mm -hmm. Public trust is, uh, I think there's, you have to redo the polling. I don't think public trust is as high as people would want it to be. And, you know, when you have people feeling very disenfranchised by what council has done in a couple of key areas, uh, and then when you have budget talks going around and you have, you know, even the city manager saying that the reason why our budget is underwater is because of legacy costs. So the police and fire that you're talking about, Christian, we got people stating that they're the reason that we're underwater. They have their own pension. When they retire, they got their own pension. So now we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna blame police and fire for our expenses, but we're gonna pay city council roughly about a million dollars a year in salaries. So I think that there's some things that have to be reworked with the, uh, with the council. Um, I think it's a slippery slope like Christian and Gilbert both said, and Elena, excuse me. Uh, you know, how, if they go to do this, they only get one bite at the apple, and there would have to be such scrutiny and such accountability to prove that this is gonna be used for what's good. And if they don't do that, they won't get it. And um, the people, the people are starting to get more engaged, but I think the way you keep them engaged is by keeping the elected officials being citizen leaders that are volunteering their time. Just like every one of you that raised your hand, you volunteer, and not a one of you raised your hand and said you got paid for that volunteering. Nor do they did it full time. Yeah. Nor do they, who who is volunteering week. 60 hours a week? Raise your hand. Now, that might come out to my question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the answer is zero. Yeah. What, the one thing I'd want to say is that, you know, I think we should always keep in mind that when, you know, this, this city charter that we're operating under, this was uh, approved, as you said, 1951. <laughs> the city's population around that time, I think, was around 400,000. Now it's close to 1.4 million. Mm -hmm. We didn't have single member districts. So you didn't have individual council members accountable to people in individual districts for constituent services. Talk to council members about the calls they get, the, the requests they get to, for dealing with issues in their district now. It's a very different proposition than it was in 1951. And I think we have to take, uh, you keep that in mind. So why don't we just add a couple more council districts? Let there be more representation. All right, so now we're going to go <laughs> to our Change the charter again. Because it seems like we have a very lively, uh, you know, sort oh, we of could keep going, we going. Love each other. <laughs> <laughs> It is important to remember that our panelists do love one another. Um, <laughs> take a picture. All right, so we have a question. Take a picture. picture. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you If you could just stand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jason Hernandez. I'm a, uh, graduating from the Masters of uh, Public Administration. Congratulations. So, oh, thank you very much. So, uh, with the current salary, do you believe that this, uh, does the city of San Antonio benefit by self-selecting those who are working at the medium income level? Because I don't foresee how those people can ever run for office and effectively serve if the uh, with the type of salaries that we have right now, do you think that we're self-selecting those uh, those individuals out of uh, government? Uh, self-selecting them out where they're not serving because they can't? Is that what you're suggesting? Because they can't survive on a single income. So there's two things, and again, you know, love finds a way, right? If you love city government, Elena pointed out, mm -hmm. she loves city government, okay? People love to watch golf. People love to watch basketball. You know, just throwing a ball, love the Spurs. You know, they love to watch football, right? And if you don't love it, you sit there and you say, why did they chase that ball in that little piece of green grass? Or why, you know, so there's, right? So you want people that have the gift and the heart to be in that arena. And I want somebody that is truly gonna be willing to, to serve. Um, and, I, and I think that that has an opportunity to show forth good people in the community. So I don't think it stops as many people as people would try to say. I think that, um, again, you know, you look at possibility of having career politicians real quick. Tiger Woods loves golf, but he loves the $1 billion <laughs> he's made doing it too. I mean, you know, Tim Duncan mm -hmm. earns his salary. <laughs> you know, if we polled the audience like you've done, Weston, and said, how many hours a month do you volunteer? And let's say the number is, 10 hours a month, which is a lot to volunteer. Is that what you want your city council person to do? Work 10 hours a month at City Hall? 
or do you want them to be at neighborhood association meetings and looking at drainage projects and figuring out how do we best serve the community? I'm telling you, I know them all. The people that I, that I couldn't agree with on almost anything. I'll give you an example. Kevin Wolf. Kevin Wolf and I barely agree on anything. And I totally respected him as a city council person because he fought hard for his community. You know why he had to move on? Because he couldn't live. Kevin had to go, Kevin had to run for another office because he couldn't eat. And it's no offense. I mean, there's nothing wrong. You've got to feed your family. And Kevin, I hardly agree on anything. And I respected everything he did on council and his hard work and dedication to his community. Okay, so we're going to have, I think, just we have time for two more questions. We'll go with Gigi and then uh, Justin here. Hi, I'm Gigi Levin. I'm a major uh, public administration and a minor nonprofit. And I put in a lot of nonprofit hours, like at Sand Ministries. Mm -hmm. I've had the pleasure and opportunity to work with Christian Archer. And mm -hmm. I love Mayor Hartberger. He was awesome. He'll be the greatest mayor of any time. Mm -hmm. You know that. And I told him that, too. Um, I have a question for you, Christian. What is it going to take in the strategic planning process to sell this idea. I do yeah, believe that's a, that's that's a, that's a, in your perspective, what do you think? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think I think that uh, uh, <laughs> and I'll be tipping you afterwards. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, no, I mean it's 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 a it's a difficult process where you've got to go out into the community, you've got to look people dead square in the eye and make the arguments that we've made here uh, and get a lot of input back from regular people that that you know Gilbert's point about nobody wants to see politicians, you know, make money or any of those things, right? You've got to go out there and you've got to sell it. You've got to make good, strong points about what do you expect from your, from your city council. Uh, you've got to poll it um, as, a, as a political guy and a guy that is a political scientist and tries to figure out what motivates people in one way or another. You know, it's a, it is a difficult thing. Because of, because of trust, and what, to Wesson's point about trust and City Hall, I would disagree with him about where City Hall's, where trust is within City Hall right now. I know exactly where Julian Castro is uh, as far as popularity goes uh, in the city. Uh, and it's why we were able to pass Pre-K for SA, which was a divisive thing that we needed to get out and talk about and have people engage in. But it passed because we made good, strong arguments as to the, the, the need for it. I think we could make those same arguments. Uh, Can I ask you a quick question yeah, about that? Yeah. Uh, how, how big an issue is it as far as the timing of, like, you know, should, would it make a big difference if we did it in the uh, 2016 presidential election cycle like you yeah, did it yeah. did, uh, yeah. with yeah. the, the term exactly. limits extension? And how far yeah. should we go as far as saying it's not going to kick in for the, the current people? Boy, every city council member and the mayor might kill me for saying this, but it should not apply to them. It should, wow. it, should, it, yeah. should it should be done in a way that is not self-serving. And, that's, and most people think of politicians as being self-serving people. Let me tell you, it, it's, it's so easy to go there. Uh, I know all of our city council members. They, they, they are there to benefit their communities. You might disagree with them on, on every issue under the sun, like I, I do with Kevin Wolf, but I know the guy did not go there in some self-serving, boy, this is all going to be about me. He got paid $20 a week, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it, it can't be self-serving. It couldn't apply to them. Um, maybe there's a time frame, Gilbert, where you could say, if you're elected four years from now, it kicks in, or something, okay. some combination for the current council members. But, another initiative. But, only got to talk about the, the timeline for a charter for current initiatives. You have spacing. Oh, there's so much more that I would do. I mean, starting a council pay, I, let me tell you, I think it's absurd that we are not paying our city council people. But there, there are plenty of other absurdities to professionalize what we're doing um, uh, at, at City Hall and, and – uh, but you've got to take them one bite, you know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You know, we did term limits. Now it's time for council pay. You know, now and, and future, future, you know, there'll be time to continue to grow and professionalize what we expect from them. I would say, just to answer the, I, you, I think you need to do it in a November ballot. It would, be, it would be preferred to have the highest amount of turnout because I think that there is a group of people in San Antonio that I, uh, have coined a phrase called the cavers, citizens against virtually everything. Uh, and they are going to turn out and vote every single time. And you can bank on that percentage that is going to vote. And the higher the turnout, the better, because you have people that will study all sides of the issue and, 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 and make a, a smart, determined decision. I think they'd vote for, that's why pre-K passed. Unless you have a special election coming up in May. Very quickly, <laughs> we're going to have to go right here to our final question. Uh, my name is Justin Weidman. I'm a, a public administration major. Um, this is for Weston Martinez. 
Um, earlier you said that paying our uh, city council would uh, breed aristocracy in our city council. Don't you think that pay, uh, the current pay of only $20 a meeting breeds aristocracy as it only allows those members that have the means and the affluences to afford to be there? So it's, a, it's actually, let me ask a question with a question then I'll answer you. So do laws keep people honest or do honest people stay honest? If somebody's a thief, guess what? I don't care if they're paid at Enron, they're gonna steal money. If somebody's a cheat, I don't care if they're a contractor working a Sims project for somebody at the city of San Antonio. Gilbert's not a contractor. I was, <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> but they're gonna cheat. Okay, so what you're asking is a heart issue. And how can I best identify somebody's heart if it's masked and jaded and hidden behind $75,000 a year? So that, so I, I am concerned, how can you, how do you do that? I'm not smart enough to be able to do that on every single person. So that's why I personally think, unfortunately, you've got to stay where it's at so we can really just hold these people as accountable as possible. And can, that can, is can, an interesting, and we'll let, we'll yeah, let you Let me just make a comment on that. I'm just going to be very real. This is what happens. I got into it. I was retired. One of the questions I had to ask myself, could I afford $20? A meeting and I went I could everything was paid car house and everything as long as my dog was taken care of I was fine hmm. that's how I got into it I had to to soul search me to see could I do this this is what actually happened on Thursdays council meetings I was the only council person at the time that was full-time because this was my job I went there it was an anomaly that the staff wasn't used to seeing a council person in the, that chair, in that office, coming five days a week, Saturdays and Sundays, calling and whatever. So what happens on Thursdays, back then, 2005, you'd have the council people coming, sitting at the dais, they're having their mail brought in, letters to signaturize, in between council stuff happening. And it's like, I'd see them, I said, what's going on? It's like, I'm juggling. I've got to do my job, I've got to do this, be it everything. That's what happens at $20 a meeting when they're trying to feed their family, et cetera. And one of the lessons I learned, I learned, learned, learned from Patty Radel, but I could do this because this was my full-time job. When, you're at the, when I got to the dais, I said, take the phone away. We didn't have cell phones in those days. You had landlines. Take the phone <laughs> away. I said, I don't want to be distracted because what I learned from Patty watching her one session, you watch them in the eye. Whoever comes to that dais, you watch them in the eye. No matter if it was, and our sessions can, went to 11 p.m. some days, we were the full time. You watch them in the eye. I could do it because I could afford to live on $20 a meeting, and that was my full time job. That is not what you're gonna get on a normal basis with this. So I just wanted to put out their reality. And I think that is a good place to stop, mainly because we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so now we will welcome back up uh, Drew to do a post-event poll. Thank our panelists once again. Thank you. Um, Thank you. If you like to just, just stay seated right where you are, because one of you might have won the raffle, so. Woo! <laughs> Exciting. We don't have to do an ethics report. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, we're we're yeah. going to have one more quick <laughs> poll. Um, which will close us out. Uh, the question is, did your perspective on this issue change any during the event today? Someone's got to show me how you do this. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> we'll give it a couple more seconds and then uh, move on. <coughs> What are you doing over there, Randy? Look, looks like are we you have, changing uh, the vote? no change is the, uh, is the predominant answer. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to do the polling for us. Uh, we want to um, acknowledge that uh, and thank Nowcast SA. Uh, they are here today videotaping, and they're going to upload everything that you've seen today onto YouTube under to pay or not to pay. So if you want to go back and review it or show it to friends, uh, feel free to check YouTube. Okay, uh, we want to introduce um, our final uh, student uh, 
Vivian Quintero, and she's going to close us out with the raffle. Did you have a raffle? Thank you, Drew. Um, as a small token <laughs> of our appreciation for this class and the general Garcia. Uh, generosity of College of Public Policy, we have four uh, raffle prizes.